There he is. Yay! Okay, are we ready to start? Uh, one minute. Okay, yeah, we're streaming on YouTube and uh, the meeting is being recorded. Thank you for joining us this evening. It is 6.03 and I'd like to open up the public safety meeting. And um, Carmela, do you have your flag for this evening? Hmm. Council member Gully, would you like to um, open us up with the Pledge of Allegiance? And could everyone please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Gully. Uh, Mara, can you please do the roll call? Uh, Council Member Gully. I am here. Council Member Ash McPherson. Here. Council Member Steele. Present. Council Member Zalewski. Here. Council President Mantello. Uh, I'm here. And Council Member McDermott. I am here. Of the committee, uh, six are present, none are absent. Uh, also with us are Council Member Cummings and uh, Chief Ben Owens and Madden. I'd like to welcome Chief Owens and um, Mayor Madden to the public safety meeting. And I'm going to ask them to give a update on the crime in the city of Troy. Good evening. Thank you for requesting me to attend this meeting to update you on our police department. I talk with most of you frequently and some of you daily, and I appreciate the chance to address the full council and the public. The most pressing topic at hand is the increase in violent crime. In the year to date, we've had 22 shooting incidents in which a total of 29 people were struck by gunfire. There have been 59 shots fired incidents this year, more than double of last year. There have been 13 homicides seven of which were criminal shooting deaths, one justifiable homicide, and two stabbing deaths. Those are the relevant statistics for the violent crime this year. Now to capture the human side of the violence. For every homicide victim, a family has lost a loved one. For every shooting victim that survives, there's a physical and emotional trauma, and unfortunately, a cycle of revenge. For witnesses and neighbors where these incidents occur, there is fear and an emotional toll as well. And for our members, the danger of responding to violent incidents, the trauma of seeing those injured and killed, especially when we are rendering first aid or trying to comfort the victim, and the frustration of a cycle of violence is difficult to interrupt, whether through little to no cooperation from victims and witnesses, or even when arrests are made and offenders are free to continue their violence. The average person may be present for a few critical incidents in their lifetime, while our members experience dozens, if not hundreds, in their career. The men and women of the Troy Police Department are physically and emotionally drained. This is compounded not just by the violent crimes that we respond to, but the hateful rhetoric, verbal attacks, and threats directed at our members and our families. I think most people realize that the police are not perfect, but we try every day to help others and we are very good at what the public and the laws require of us. Most people that we talk to want more police presence in their neighborhoods in hopes of preventing crime and working together to make everyone safer. But a small group of people have such hate for the police and the rule of law that they attempt to create chaos, instill fear, and destroy those positive relationships we have within our community. Many of you have likely seen online videos of incidents in the past few weeks and months where our members were subjected to vile, hateful verbal abuse and agitation. Our members have remained professional, restrained, and committed to keeping the peace, even in the face of these reprehensible acts. Despite the weariness and frustration of our members, we stand ready to serve and to answer the call where we are needed. 
We hope that the entire council will support our department and the people of our city to deserve peace, respect, and safety. Thank you. Are there any other further discussions or any questions for Chief Owens? I'd like to open up the floor. Chairperson McDermott. Council Member Zalewski. Uh, Chief, just a quick question. The um, the stats that you read, I wasn't, I, I didn't get to uh, jot them down uh, fast enough. Are you going to be able to make that available to us, to the committee? Certainly. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Great, thank you. Chairperson. Council President. Yep. Um, thank you, uh, Brian. And um, I just want to go on record. Um, our men and women on the force um, have, you know, certainly endured uh, the past six months, increased violence, um, increased neighborhood crimes. Um, and obviously the present climate has, you know, not helped um, the morale on the force. So, you know, I guess a couple of questions um, moving forward. Um, how is the morale? Number two, um, I do know that, you know, you talk common, you talk sense and sense, sense in terms of S-E-N-S-E, -S -E, um, the morale of the force, and then C-E-N-T-S, um, our budget, obviously, the OT, on the budget, we all know has has certainly um, been blown. But saying that, I, I do know, uh, I had asked you, I believe a few weeks ago, how much the uh, one protest uh, cost in overtime. And I think you gave a figure of maybe over $12,000 for just that one day. So just moving forward, you know, on two fronts, I think it's very important for the council to recognize the morale of the force. Um, you know, what can we do um, other than what we've been doing, which has been obviously supporting our men and women on the force. Um, and then number two, uh, obviously, um, you know, the budget, we know that we're going to go over on the OT, but is there anything else we can do from here till the end of the year uh, to support your efforts, minus obviously the surveillance cams and the body cams, which are on this week. Thank you. Thanks to speak to the uh, overtime portion first. Um, I don't know the exact figures in front of me, but I think we're probably at about $998,000 in overtime of our, I think we were budgeted like 1.15, maybe I have to look it up, but Clearly, we're almost at the point of reaching our overtime, budgeted overtime for the year. So it is an expense. This year has been unusual in a lot of circumstances, not just from a violent crime perspective, but as you mentioned, uh, protests and rallies, which are all important, protected First Amendment rights, and, and we have to support that. We want to keep people safe that are attending. Um, so there is an expense attached to that. Um, we can certainly break out those expenses uh, to see individually what each costs. And then there's some costs that aren't captured just in straight overtime. Um, and we have to figure out how to calculate that as well. In terms of the morale of the department, um, I think law enforcement in general has had a very difficult time in recent months. Um, our department, we are still committed to the work we do and the people we serve. Uh, but that's not to say that we're not human and, and we're not worn down by a lot of what's going on. And so as much as we appreciate the support from the council for our members, we also know that you support the people of the city who ask us to respond to crime, to calls. It doesn't always have to be a violent incident. There's a lot of things that we handle on a daily basis that are helpful to the community. We need to be able to do that as well as deal with all the violent crime. So every time we have a serious incident, that's a drain on resources, uh, not just the dollars and, and the budget, but the personnel cost. And I can tell you our members have worked, are, are continuing to work long hours on a daily and weekly basis and that catches up to them, you know, just on a human level. That's that's time that they're just their mind is just absorbed with dealing with whatever they're focused on. It's time away from their families, but they do that willingly, knowing that there are families who may never see a loved one again because of the victim of a homicide, or they want to make sure that people can feel safe in their community. Can we, as the police department, guarantee that? Unfortunately, we can't. It's bigger than the police. Uh, but again, thank you for the support. 
that each of you showed to the police department, but your support for the city as well, and the residents who are asking us uh, to do more if possible. Would increasing uh, the minimum manning chief um, by two, I mean, I know obviously we're going to see a number of vacancies in the very near future, and including uh, yesterday and tomorrow. And, um, you know, I also understand even if we were to hire new officers and not laterals, you know, we're talking, you know, months in terms of actually getting them out on the streets. So um, what can we do to alleviate, obviously, you know, just that, that, that wear and tear? Um, because, it, obviously, it's it, I, I see it firsthand, you know, full disclosure, Nikki's my nephew, and I know the hours that he's been putting in. So um, would increasing minimum manning by two help that? Um, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to reach here. Minimum, minimum staffing, as we've talked about, is uh, eight patrolmen, one sergeant for each shift, the three shifts. And um, to add to that, without increasing the total available pool, I think becomes difficult. I think it just puts more of a strain on what we have available. Um, and we do try to augment the minimum. So that's the minimum. There are days where we have more people scheduled to work and that's, that's uh, an increase in and of itself. We have overtime through different details, um, through the state and federal government, which we can use to augment both uh, proactive patrols and also the investigative uh, hours. But I don't really know that increasing the minimum staffing uh, will be beneficial. That potentially could impact um, time off availability for people on their regular days off or if they wanna take time off, which they do need to decompress as, as we all do. Um, also right now we're in a period of time where we're in our uh, fall in service training period, the 40 hour uh, one week training period where we cover a number of topics. We do the same in the spring. And that also is a draw on our available pool. As you mentioned, we have vacancies. So as of tomorrow, so uh, Detective Millington retired, we have the, uh, Sergeant Carell retiring. So not only are we losing people in terms of numbers of staffing, the two of them represent close to 70 plus years of police experience. And that's, that's a huge loss to our department as well. So as of tomorrow, we'll have five vacancies. We have five in the academy. We had one uh, recruit um, drop out of the academy for personal reasons. Um, and then in addition to that, and then we've talked about this before, but we have other people out on extended sick leave, military leave, and uh, so that, that total is about 10. So right off the top, there's 20 positions that aren't truly available for staffing to be plugged into scheduling. Um, we have looked at increasing the, the minimum staffing. I don't know that we have enough people available to consistently support that, but as I mentioned, we do use overtime to augment that, which is extremely helpful. Um, we do try to concentrate on hotspots, known hotspots, which can be helpful. But as we've seen just recently, we had a shooting incident or a person was shot in the head on a, on a street where we typically don't have any calls for service or very few, and certainly not violent crime. Um, so I can't, I can't say if increasing the minimum staffing is going to solve uh, the problem. Uh, we've looked at it, and if we could increase the overall staffing of the department, I think that would be helpful going forward. Again, that's a long-term proposition. And uh, as you mentioned, there's a budget component attached to that. So that's something for, uh, for you all to consider. And uh, Chairperson? Yes, Council President. Thanks. Um, I, I'll, I'll just end with one uh, final. And, you know, the institutional knowledge is, is definitely um, going to hurt the department short-term and long-term. Um, you know, but saying that, and I know um, this has kind of, you know, gotten a little cold water thrown on it, and that's um, just, you know, my suggestion of a very targeted um, capital region, multi-jurisdictional um, task force that our DAs would actually, you know, maybe even oversee in conjunction uh, with potentially the state and county forces in, believe me, this, uh, what I'm talking about, very temporary, targeted, hotspot task force, Albany, Schenectady, Troy, more Albany, 
County and uh, Rensselaer County working together, much like the governor proposed maybe four or five years ago, MS-13, uh, Long Island, there were uh, very strong gangs down there and there was a task force that was developed to tackle temporary, temporary tackling of um, these crimes because if they are related and I have no inside knowledge if they're related or not and I get it, I know that we're working together, I know we're sharing information, but this would be a much more enhanced and much more focused and um, you don't have to comment on that. It was more a commentary on my part. And I, I understand kind of the lukewarm, um, you know, issues with it. But at the same time, um, you know, I have talked to various folks in the law enforcement field. And, you know, I do believe that something very just drastic, direct, targeted, enhanced needs to happen in the capital region right now because it is a cycle. We're seeing it, Albany County, oh, uh, city of Albany, city of Troy, then once in a while, Cohoes, once in a while, Schenectady. And, um, you know, certainly we know youth programs, social services, et cetera. This is more short-term targeted. Um, the long-term approach, obviously, community policing, et cetera. But this would be, you know, just a much more enhanced task force, but it's just something that I, I just feel is really needed at this at this time period. So thanks, Chair. Chair. Council Member Cummings. I just wanted to sort of build off of that point from Council President Mantello and maybe ask a direct question around uh, to the extent you can talk about. My sense is that there's already significant collaboration across uh, many of those agencies. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about the collaboration that's already happening um, across those agencies and uh, how it might be enhanced, if, you, if there's anything you can speak to on that front. Sure, absolutely. And on a daily basis, we're talking to our local counterparts, particularly Albany and Skakke, but all surrounding uh, local law enforcement agencies within the county and, and outside the county. Uh, we participate, we have task force members on a federal task force um, for the Safe Streets, for FBI, for the DEA, and for the ATF. Uh, those partnerships bring in a tremendous amount of resources as we need for investigations, and it's, it's a great uh, partnership with, with those agencies. Our detectives, uh, as we investigate cases, are talking to their counterparts at either our state, local, federal partners on a daily basis. So that, that coordination uh, is definitely happening. If there's a more formalized regional task force, I don't know who would make that determination or, or how that would be brought together, but I think most of that work is happening. I don't know that it's necessarily called a particular task force at this time, uh, but to just kind of reassure you that is definitely happening uh, on a daily basis. Can you speak to the extent of interconnection between the rise in violent crime in Troy, Albany and other surrounding communities to what extent those are connected uh, versus maybe part of a broader uh, trend that isn't necessarily directly connected in terms of people involved. I don't know to what degree you can speak to that at this point, um, but no, I, what's your yeah, sense of how connected those uh, those trends are? I think the crime, crime is definitely connected. It, it crosses jurisdictional boundaries. There's no question about that. Um, that's not to say that all the crimes occurring in Troy are necessarily caused by criminals from other uh, cities or locations, but I just think that the ease of movement and uh, the spread of crime is just well beyond the city of Troy. Um, yeah, I can't really give it like specifics at this point, but to say that there are some common uh, players amongst all the cities or all the locations is, is probably fair to say. Sure. And it sounds like there is deep uh, collaboration with detectives in those cities as well, um, beyond any uh, named task force. Um, let's see, on a totally other uh, subject, I wanted to check in on, um, I know um, the New York State Legislature passed repeal of 50A, uh, and there has been some discussion as to how and when uh, police internal records uh, would be released. I know some FOIL requests were submitted. Um, are you working on responding to those FOIL requests or, and or working on a more systematic approach uh, to that public information? 
We're definitely happen? working. In, we're definitely working on the FOIL requests themselves. I mean, some of them are just so broad, and, and we may not even have records that they're asking for, so it's difficult to kind of sort through that. Um, okay. We have a recent promotion of our inspection services bureau captain, and he's going to be working on that. Assistant Chief Keen has already been working on that in the absence of that ISP captain, and we're trying to uh, comply with those flow requests. But they're considerable, and uh, a lot of it may not even be, be there with their they asking for. Yeah, it seems, I mean, from my perspective, it seems like a uh, flow request is a pretty um, bureaucratic and, and maybe uh, a lot more difficult way to go. I know some other communities have figured out a way to sort of systematically uh, black out any information that needs to remain private and then uh, just publish uh, the information that can be public. Um, where do we stand on that? Uh, what's the sort of manpower that that would take to uh, to do that in a more systematic way than rather than responding to uh, to FOIA requests? I'm just, you know, broadly, our city government is very um, responsive to, to um, things coming at us every day. We were reactionary. Um, and I, to the extent possible, I like to find ways to uh, foresee potential um, future questions and concerns and, and react in a proactive way. So in terms of proactively um, making that data more accessible to the public, um, what would it take to move in that direction over the next uh, few months? It's definitely staffing intensive, but it's something we've considered and looked at. What are the ways that we can uh, reasonably Put that information out there however it is contained again you know redacting any personal information um, but certainly can we make that available you're absolutely right other agencies have done that uh, some have put everything out there uh, but we have had discussions with the city uh, corporation council to make sure that we're in compliance with FOIA law and being respective of privacy on both sides so we want to share the information and what those uh, like the total number of complaints or types of complaints we want to be able to post that so going forward we're trying to um, adjust how we track those. Uh, our, our tracking mechanism really wasn't, we could tell the total number of cases, we could sort them by hand, but we didn't really have an automated or roll up of all those uh, complaints. We want to be able to post that. Uh, initially, it might just be generic information, the number of types of complaints, and then we can move forward on how do we plug in more particular details. I think going forward with the uh, PORB, the Police Objective Review Board, that'll be um, something we can discuss with them and maybe through that committee, That'll help us get more of that information out there. Um, certainly, people are, are, are welcome to make a, welcome to make complaints about officers' conduct, and, and we welcome that if it's, it's valid. Um, like I said before, in a, another public meeting, and certainly individually to others, we don't have a lot of complaints. Um, a lot of times, it could be a misunderstanding of, of what's happening at the scene, or just a failure to fully explain it, uh, or sometimes it's just people being or feeling that the officers are being rude. And uh, so I, I, as much as we don't gotta get the uh, complaint process out there, uh, I just wanna make it clear that we don't have like this overwhelming problem with uh, abuse on our, our members. Yeah, I, I guess that goes to that. I, I sent an email a while back about our complaint process and to what degree um, it, my sense is it's, it's set up to start an investigation, which makes sense. You wanna be talking to a captain. Um, but I'm one, wondering about a, a lower bar uh, initial uh, process. And I think that'll go into the, the police objective review board uh, discussion, how they're involved with that process. But uh, where are you at with discussions of our, our complaint process in the first place and how to make sure A, it's accessible, but B, maybe doesn't always require someone to meet with the police as the uh, initial. I know there's a, a option to meet with the corporation council instead, uh, but, um, even that, you know, other communities, literally, you can just send an email to start the process. It wouldn't necessarily reflect on someone's uh, official record until you have a signed affidavit. Um, but to, to at least be able to, to get feedback and start the process, I think it is important to, to significantly lower that bar from, from needing to have those, you know, conversations that may be intimidating to some people. Absolutely understood. So uh, the mayor and I and our command staff have talked about that. We want to have an intake process that maybe allows for that. Um, the way it stands out where a person is making a complaint, we do want that face-to-face -face interaction so we can have an evaluation. And a lot of times maybe that conversation can lead to an explanation and they, uh, the person making the complaint has a better understanding and it resolves at that point. But we do want to look for something, I mean, with technology and online and, and we have online tips for things that we want to get information in. 
So we're looking to see if there's a way as an intake, not as a formal complaint, because again, as you said, it would be unfair to start the process on either just a blanketly anonymous or something that could be easily uh, gamed, if you will, where the numbers could be just driven up artificially. So we are looking for a way to do that, to have that initial intake happen online. So that there, if there is a concern about that face-to-face -face interaction with the police, people have, do have another option. So again, as you mentioned, the board will be part of that process and, and what that looks like, we'll have to see. Great, good transition. <laughs> Chair. Council member Ash McPherson. Chief, um, first I'd like to thank you for being here tonight. I know how busy you are. Um, I'm one of those people that have been on the phone with you for the last few weeks, all hours of the day, night, as well as reaching out to the mayor. Um, I'd like to say as far as with the morale of our officers, I've spoken with many of the officers and a lot of them feel they do not have the support um, of the community. And I just wanna say, I know in district two, um, as you know, I've been down there in, on 7th and Glen in different areas down there. And there are many taxpayers, residents, renters. They all do want the police presence. They all are standing with the police because they, they know what's going on down there and they wanna try and help in any way they can. Um, I, we had such great news, you know, um, arresting someone um, in the connection of the murder of Aishan. And that was short lived of a sigh of a relief to have two more shootings on the same day and to lose uh, a 17 year old. Uh, Tamara Rodriguez. Um, I've spoken with his parents, uh, his mother, I should say, Tamari's mother. And um, what she wanted me to relay to the police was that she's been living in that area for five years. She's been raising her five other children in that area. Um, she is is afraid she's afraid for her children she's afraid that something else is going to happen as all or quite a few other residents in that area she wanted me to relay that whatever the police can do to find justice for their son um and that they want and she wants more police presence in that area they said that they wanted the store closed. And I know that's a very difficult thing to do, to close a store that is utilized. The store may not be the problem. It's a hanging out in front of the store. Um, that might be the issue. I don't know what else to do and what else asking. Um, for more cars, for looking, and I know we are short. I, I get that. Looking to have, and I do know you patrol in that area because I've seen it. Um, and I do know they're in there quite frequently. But every time a car comes out of there, the activity comes in there. It's like they're almost watching and they're seeing and they're paying attention to the social media and to the police scanners. Um, I'm not sure if I've been down there at night with that street light, increasing that street light on that corner. If we need to get another type of light in that area to put some more light in there. I'm not sure if, if that's going to help deter the criminal activity. What steps can the police, the mayor, us, the citizens take to try. And, and again, I know we've got Adams Street, Jefferson, South Troy area. It's not, there's other areas that this is happening in, but district two has had it quite a lot, more than normal, more than it should. 
what steps can be taken? What steps are we going to take to try and help this area? We certainly share uh, Tamari's mother's fear of, of more violence in that neighborhood, in that area. Um, and so what we have tried to do to the extent that we can is to put additional patrols. But within that few block radius, you know that we've had multiple shootings, several homicides to include when our officers have been either on the block or within a block. So even just a mere presence of the police sometimes doesn't even serve as a deterrent any longer. Uh, and that, that's frightening on a lot of levels, particularly for us. Um, in terms of lighting, I know from the neighborhood uh, meetings that we've had and that you've been a part of that, that talked about a citywide lighting program. And even within the existing street lights, the ones that were not working on, on our midnight shift, we routinely go through and make a list that's been reported. You've helped report some. And uh, National Grid now, National Grid has made uh, those repairs as needed. As far as Different lighting or future lighting, I'll leave that to you know, someone else to decide. Um, in terms of the store, I agree it tends to attract activity, which for the most part is good activity. People need a store in the neighborhood, but where it attracts a, a focal point for uh, drive-by shootings, I don't know that the police can necessarily shut down the store for, for such a reason. Um, so we'd have to have further discussions on what that looks like or if there's other steps at other agencies or departments can take. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. She, that, I'm sorry. As far as the cameras, I know back in 2016, 2017, Council President Mantello, Councilman Gully, we were on the council at that time and we were going back and forth with the cameras at that time. Um, Lennon 7th was a hot spot back then and the store had abatement, noose and abatement points assessed to it. And it was enough of them to have the store closed down. The corporate council at the time had stated to me, and I think it was in 2017, that the store wasn't going to get shut down because the store had cameras that the police were going to be able to utilize. Are those cameras inside that store accessible to the police? Are they, I, you may not be able to comment, but are there, there cameras in that store that they do have? Yeah, I can't say for certain what cameras they have or if they're accessible to us, but what I can say in, in investigations, video can be useful um, as evidence, or even if it's not direct evidence, it can be a useful investigative tool. Um, I don't know if they, if they have cameras, if that's a reason to not shut them down, I, I can't speak to that nuisance abatement process in terms of what you were told on that. In terms of the city cameras, it absolutely has been an ongoing thing. It's finally, I believe, our next uh, next week's meeting for finance and then hopefully full council to move forward with the repairs and the improvements to the existing camera locations. Uh, obviously, we would love to expand the camera program uh, to areas throughout the city. As you mentioned, that is, that is a hotspot. So if we could have additional funding, we can add cameras to the system. Um, Again, though, just as police officers being on the block isn't always necessarily a deterrent to a violent crime, we've had crimes occur directly under very visible city cameras. They're not, they're not hidden, they're not covert. Um, and so they can be useful after the fact a lot of times. Um, but if we can add to, the, add to them and it does deter anything, then, it, then it's worth it. So um, thank you for moving that forward, the whole council. Hopefully it's uh, approved next week and we can move forward with the vendor on that. Um, we can also talk about the body cameras if that's a topic, if anybody wants to talk about that. What? Go ahead, Jim. Chief, on the cameras, I'm just wondering as, we, as we're working through this um, contract with this new supplier, was there any mention of possibly any portable cameras that would be able to be moved around the city to hot spots or uh, put into difficult areas for a time period, something that would give us some portability on some of those cameras so we could have better access to hotspots as they occur? We were talking about portable cameras, not just with the, the vendor we hope to select, but other vendors, and there's difficulty in uh, power. So if, if they're just standalone, they're battery operated, they don't last very long. Um, and 
depending on where they are physically located uh, geographically, there may not be any connection back to uh, the station where they could be recorded. So if it's a local standalone camera and it could record locally, um, the question would be power, can we power it from a light pole? Or a lot of times down the astro grid requires a meter. Uh, typically before, if there was a traffic control box that the city owned and they had power, we would use that. Uh, but a lot of these locations don't necessarily have a traffic control box with city power going to it. So we'd have to add a meter. Um, but in, in the in the short term, once we talk with the new vendor, we say, hey, here's what we have. They know the location of the existing cameras. We have asked them what would it cost to add on. And so if it's close to existing cameras and wireless infrastructure, I think it'll be a lot easier. So where there's a camera on Glen and Six, once that infrastructure, the wireless is improved, if then we can just tie into the network from Glen and Seven to there, I think it'll be a lot easier. Um, so we are asking those questions. We'll come back with the cost and, and we'll see if we can do that. Thank you, Chief. You're welcome. Is there any further discussion? Chair. Sure. Yep. yep. Go ahead. Council member Gully. Uh, another question, Chief. Um, as you know, back a year or two ago, we spoke about outfitting our gateways with plate readers. And um, I know there was an excessive cost to that, but the reality is it gives us a way to babysit our gateways and know who's coming and who's going to our city. Um, I heard today an announcement by the Rensselaer County Executive, uh, Steve McLaughlin, that he's trying to partner with Albany County uh, Executive Dan McCoy to do exactly that, to take the gateways to the counties and to um, uh, supply them with uh, plate readers. Uh, would you be encouraging and also helping to find a way to get that done in our, in our city and around our county? Uh, well, I know you would. But is there, I just want to mention if there's something we can do, this is a time to really to join forces and, and really uh, put this put this plan together because it's a time where we really need a little bit of oversight there. Absolutely. We would, we would of course, support it, as you said. But uh, we have shared services agreements with other uh, police departments within Rensselaer County, but we also work closely with other uh, surrounding counties. So um, the Green Island Bridge, there is a plate reader. Uh, that's a partnership with Green Island. And so we look, we were hoping to expand that. So if at the county levels, they can bring funding and resources to make that happen, of course, we fully support that. And I think it needs to be that next level of government. I don't think the city can afford to do all these projects on its own. So there is definitely a regional nexus with crime. If the counties can get together and figure out a way to do that, or the state can supply money. We've in the past applied for state grants for fixed LPRs. Uh, we weren't successful. It's very competitive and it's just a very small pot of money that everybody's competing for. So if that is moving forward, we, I mean, we've been discussing that for a while. So that's good to hear if you heard that it's moving forward. Yeah, I just heard that today and uh, I was excited to hear that because I thought, and, and, and you're right, this is, this is more than the city. We need to get help from the big brothers upstairs, the county and the state and federal level to really put a squash on this high level of uh, crime that we're occurring with. Chair. Council President. Uh, perfect. It leads right into uh, um, first, I'll, I'll just ask the mayor maybe at some point to give an update on the LED lighting um, chief, because there is a whole effort to change the lighting all throughout our city. And the council actually um, passed a uh, major piece, piece of legislation last year regarding that. So maybe we could get an update on that. Um, secondly, and more importantly, Council Member Gully, um, you know, brings up Big Brother, State, Federal. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't want to talk about, but I'm going to talk about because I think it, it does have um, a direct and an indirect impact on what's happening uh, in the capital region throughout the state, and that's bail reform. And, you know, I know some folks had said, have uh, stated well, you know, bail reform has an, had an impact on uh, what's happening with, with gun and neighborhood violence. But, you know, we spoke to you when this bill was first signed into law and uh, you saw the impact immediately. And I was just wondering if you could share with the council and the public what you've seen firsthand. Yeah, I definitely think we're seeing the effects of bail reform, raise the age and discovery to some extent. And while uh, some of those reforms were certainly important, if there was abuses of 
you know, uh, bail or whatever the particular topic was. Um, as we talked about, if, if people are released, and again, bail was not to be punitive, it's to, to ensure the return of the defendant to court, but at least it seemed to temporarily, if somebody was in custody, it broke the cycle of violence, that, that quick turnaround where somebody wanted to retaliate. And uh, so I think we're seeing the effects of it. I think we, we all warned of the potential effects of it. Um, I, I'm sure you'll see formal studies going forward of what that is actually uh, caused from that, but I, I think it has had a negative effect for sure. Thank you, Chief. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to follow up also, maybe you or the mayor could uh, give an update on the body camps. I know it's going to be on Thursday's agenda, but you did mention it earlier, and that'd be great. Thank you. Is there a question before we move to that topic? Or? I, I had a quick question on the bail reform follow up. If we could do that, hit that first and then go to the body cameras. Is that all right? Chair? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so I guess given where we stand with, with bail reform, are there other strategies that you are um, undertaking towards sort of violence interruption and community support to? Um, you know, if you can't just uh, hold people, are there other ways uh, of supporting those communities to reduce those cycles that you're exploring or other partners that may be needed on that? There's definitely other partners working on that. There's a SNUG program, uh, both within Troy and, and Albany. Um, so yeah. and what the purpose is, is kind of disrupt that cycle of violence. And I know they're active. Um, by design, we're not uh, directly involved in a lot of their activities, and they want to keep that separate. So um, maybe people are more comfortable talking to the snug representatives versus the police department. Um, but they're they're active in our community, so that um, hopefully can help. I don't know that it's had a lot of effect just looking at the numbers this year. Um, but I don't even know that it, that program or others like it can necessarily prevent the the violent crimes from occurring. Um, but hopefully programs like that can disrupt the cycle of revenge and retaliation um, so that we don't see these back and forth shootings. Okay. Sure. sure. I would like to um, echo what Council Member Ash McPherson said about um, reaching out into the community and speaking with com the community leaders in North Central. And they are supporting our Detroit police and want them in their neighborhoods. And I'd also like to thank Chief Owens and um, his force for all that they are doing in the community to make it better. Thank you. Chairperson McDermott. You're muted, um, Eileen. Maybe. Council Member Zalewski. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Chief, I, I did have a question. Um, I wanted to go back to the overtime because I know you, uh, you, know, you mentioned that we were seeing uh, a higher levels of overtime than usual, but I just, my thought, I actually thought that overtime was going to go down and just hear me out on this. I know you're thinking I'm insane. Um, we, we've canceled a ton of events in Troy the pig out, river fest, chowder fest, RPI graduations, like all the things where I believe we would have uh, paid overtime to uh, Troy police. And, and I could be completely wrong about this, but uh, is, is it none of that w helping to wash wash out the, inc the increase in overtime? Um, some of the, so some of those details you mentioned would be overtime details. Some would be reimbursed to the city. So that cost would be uh, absorbed. I think where we, haven't done those, it has helped the overall increase. Um, so I think our overtime would be that much more had we had those normal events. But um, we've had overtime related to, to the coronavirus itself. We've had overtime related to uh, protests and rallies. And But the biggest piece is the violent crime. And so um, you know, this year alone, we're talking 13 homicides. So what goes with that in terms of the uh, investigation process and the uh, directed patrols in those areas, that probably the bulk of it um, to see the increase. So years where we have less serious crimes, less critical incidents, but we have those details, uh, it would be less. Um, so 
so I think, as you mentioned, we didn't have those details, but those events were only a small portion of what we have uh, gone up by. So um, had we had all our normal events, we would be even higher in our attendance. Understood. Thank you. Welcome. Chair. Council member Ash McPherson. Chief, can you can you let the council, you know, address the council that when there is a protest, um, what happens as there's a protest, like our police officers are in that area, they're monitoring it. That does bring us into overtime. And we've had a lot of, of different protests in different areas where our police, and correct me if I'm wrong, where our police have had to stay there, which incurs overtime and also would bring in other munis coming in to help? Certainly. I, so, yeah. So in terms of uh, protests or anything like that, it, it depends on the crowd size. So we have to be able to respond appropriately. And again, we're there to ensure that they can safely protest. If it's a peaceful protest, that's uh, a guaranteed constitutional, constitutional freedom. And we support that. We understand it. Even if we don't like what's said to our members all the time. Um, so that does create uh, a need for traffic control, pedestrian control. Um, and then if those officers are assigned to zones, now we're calling back to fill the zone so that we can continue to respond uh, for calls for service throughout the city. Um, where outside agencies come in and mutual aid for a critical incident or uh, something serious, there is no direct overtime cost to us that's absorbed by those agencies. And just as if they had something uh, major, we would support them as well. Um, we can we can go through and break down the cost and I can provide that to you all. Uh, the protests are a significant portion of our increase in overtime, but I really feel like it's the bulk of it is gonna be from uh, those major incidents that we've had, homicides and otherwise. Chair. Council member Steele. Thank you. Chief, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I hope that you will convey the council support to our force. I mean, these are troubling times um, and, and we certainly uh, feel for what they're going through um, as well as those in the community. This is, uh, this is unprecedented, it's painful. Um, and I'm not even sure if you can speak to this, but what troubles me and I know many others is the accessibility of, of weapons, of guns. Um, it, what can we do to curtail that and, and, and save, save our children in some way? I mean, this is, it's out of hand it's, and, and I don't know where we start. It's a great question. Unfortunately, we don't have all the answers to that. I think the accessibility of firearms, um, I don't know if it's increased or not, maybe it has, but the willingness of people to use firearms to solve what should be very minor problems seems to be uh, just as disturbing. And so uh, I think if we can, as a community, not the police department, as a community, kind of address that and to teach good values and to model good behavior and to give people a sense of hope and opportunity. So there's no reason to turn to a firearm to settle a dispute. I mean, it's just, I don't have the answer, but I know if we could fix that part of it, um, whether guns are available or not, I think that would solve a lot of our, our problems. Um, we appreciate your support and as equally for the support of our members, the fact that you're saying you're supportive of the community because that's that's who's really suffering at this point. Um, whether they're individually a victim of a crime or just collectively the sense that they're not safe in their communities. And, and that's something we wanna work on, not just making sure that people are safe, but that they feel safe. Um, we appreciate your support for the community as well as us. Okay. Council member Cummings. Can you speak to um, how the deployment decisions are made with regard to these rallies? Um, I know, it, I, I've certainly seen it a few times where it seems like uh, there may be a, a larger presence than is warranted. I know it's always hard to tell what a crowd is going to do, um, but uh, you know, having the whole force out front, uh, or having um, you know, even you know, we had literally a state police helicopter over over for for 
a whole day uh, in response to probably 50 people outside the police station. Um, so those sort of deployment decisions, how are they made and um, maybe what are the communication channels that may be helpful to help you make better, uh, more informed decisions as to what the possibilities are uh, and make sure that you're prepared for whatever possibilities may come, but uh, maybe those those costs don't need to be as high as they are. Sure. So just just to uh, to reassure you, we consider cost uh, in a lot of our decisions and most of our decisions, but it's not the overriding cost when it comes to the safety of the public. So um, in in terms of evaluating an event, if it's a planned event, we try to reach out to the organizers. If no, a lot of times things are posted on social media, so we try to make that connection. Uh, particularly if it's local people involved, we, we probably know them. Um, yeah. So that's been helpful a lot of times. And again, that's that's to ensure their safety, not just from any uh, crime or violence, but just to move through the streets safely. Um, sure. But uh, we kind of evaluate as things happen. And a lot of these uh, protests, rallies, uh, kind of just are emerging events and they become bigger than what they initially were intended. So a lot of times we're scrambling to react and uh, right. pull in much help as we can. So where the times where we call for mutual aid, if we bring in outside agencies, uh, while they provide personnel to support us, it's still their decision on what resources they bring. So uh, you mentioned the helicopter. If we request mutual aid and the state police come in and that's part of the uh, their decision and their planning to bring in a helicopter to support them, then that's their call. Uh, I think if it's the one I think you're talking about, I think it was helpful um, because it, it uh, gave us the report of, of the car in front of City Hall. So the helicopter was useful for real-time intelligence. Um, but even if even if every protest is entirely peaceful, which we hope it is, uh, just the sheer numbers of people, we have to be prepared if it, if it does change. And not to say that everybody involved would be uh, violent or committing crimes, but some people do take advantage of peaceful rallies and they insert themselves in and they try to provoke, provoke a response from the police um, or they fight amongst the group that, that's there uh, protesting peacefully. So we have to be prepared for that. And then as, as well as dealing with whatever that um, group of people, their location, we have to be prepared to respond throughout the city for all those ordinary calls for service that are gonna continue to come in. Um, so I can't give you a hard and fast rule on what, hey, if we know there's gonna be hundred people, we bring in 10 police officers. It's, it's uh, really okay. situational dependent. We have so, time to plan, we do. Okay. Good. And, and so I guess from a from a public standpoint, to the extent um, organizers can be in touch with you, that helps you make stronger decisions, I assume. <laughs> okay. It's just helpful for everyone involved. Yep, absolutely. Great. Chair? Council President? Yep. Um, Chief, I want to once again thank you for, you know, being uh, very candid and, and open. I think it's important. And honestly, um, you know, folks from the public, from the community, from the neighborhood, like uh, Council Member Ash McPherson and others and Council Member McDermott have, has mentioned, it's a partnership. You can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. Government's not going to be the answer. The community can't do it alone. We have to all work together and it is strength in numbers. One of the things, and you know, maybe this is just me, um, I truly believe um, that over probably the last seven, eight, nine months, we've seen um, the police force so taxed on the violent crimes that unfortunately some of the lower level crimes um, have not been able to be addressed, you know, i.e. Um, you guys worked, the men and women worked so hard during the summer to deter fireworks. Um, we know it was a huge problem here in the city of Troy. Um, you can only hit so many spots where um, these lower level crimes are happening. And I do believe that we have an opportunity, which we're going to talk about later with the executive order under the governor to really um, look at our police department with some of these lower level crimes that we've talked about, um, the mental health uh, calls and things to that nature to see 
if we could alleviate some of that burden on our police force um, so they can tackle the crimes they should be tackling. Um, so saying that, that's a, a bigger issue. But one of the things that I have seen, to get back to my point, is over the last eight or nine months, some of these lower level, you know, even traffic stops, things to that nature, um, have been unable to be addressed because of all the violent crime here in the city of Troy. As you said, you know, sometimes you have 10, 12 people on a scene after a homicide, after a shooting, you know, the evidence technicians, you name it. Um, you know, how, how has that impact had an impact? See, I truly believe that the lower level crimes have dominoed to bigger crimes. And I don't know how we fix that. And, you know, that's why I go back to um, the targeted enhanced task force. Um, but saying that, have you seen that the lower level crimes, unfortunately, are not able to be addressed because of the violent crime? Everything is a matter of prioritization and resources for us. So um, to the degree there are times where we cannot respond to um, lower level crimes or we just take that initial report and no follow up. Um, sadly, that is the case. I know our detective bureau in particular, um, working on several open active homicide investigations, there are lower level crimes that are waiting to be fully investigated. And that's just a product of not having enough people right. uh, and enough hours in the day to devote to that. So that is true. And it, that, that follows along on the patrol side where there are definitely quality of life calls where we cannot fully address. I mean, even if we respond and maybe stop something for the moment, loud music or as you mentioned, fireworks, which was yeah. this year, just insane across state and country. Um, but so it does, it does have an effect. I mean, there's, yeah. there's only only place we can be at once. And um, that is true. I would encourage people as things happen, please call us anyway. Uh, even if we can't respond as quickly as we ordinarily might, we'll get there when we can. And uh, just to have things documented so we're aware where these things are happening, we can follow up. Um, if there's more resources that can be brought in, not just more police officers, as you mentioned uh, on other things, the health side or social services. We work well with those agencies. I don't know if they're fully staffed or resources as well to be like a full-time response model, like the police department. We think about it, we're 24 seven. Uh, we have cars that go anywhere in the city. We're always available. We're, we're a three digit uh, phone number call away. Everybody calls 911 and that's good and that's fine. But if we can bring in other resources and agencies to handle problems that aren't a crime or could be better served by other agencies. We're all for that. There's, there's no question on that. Thank you. One more thing. I talked about the body cameras. I didn't have an opportunity to answer that. Again, that is on the agenda as well for the next uh, finance meeting. We have a vendor selected. We're going to move forward in the process. Uh, we're looking at a lead time of hopefully six to eight weeks um, for those to be supplied, the training, and get that in place. Um, that's where we stand on the body camera. If there's any further questions, I can answer those. I have a quick question on that. Yep. Council Member Cummings. Um, and sorry if this has already been provided, but can you speak a bit to the the policy um, and the availability of that policy uh, with regard to access of video records? The uh, policy on the body work camera program, we're, we're still. Uh, we have a draft that's nearly complete. We've had a few um, back and forths with uh, the, the unions, particularly the PBA, both PBA and codes, um, as uh, negotiated working conditions. And I think we're very close to finalizing that. Um, I can check with the mayor to see if that can be provided in draft form to the council. I'd like to see that before I uh, appropriate funds for it. Yeah. I'll leave that to the mayor to discuss with you, but uh, certainly, yeah, if you have particular questions about the, the, the policy of the body care program, we can follow up later. You're welcome to reach out right. to us if you like. However you want to handle that. I mean, the particular, particular question is, is to what degree does the public have access to files if they request them? And, and what is that process to get them? So our understanding at this point is going to follow the FOIL process as it stands because there are necessary uh, safeguards in place for the privacy of individuals not involved. So as we think about it moving forward, there's there's a concern. We've we've seen um, concern about 
public privacy, and we're trying to consider that as well, because people may be involved in something that it shouldn't necessarily be out there just because the public wants to see the video. It's a little bit of a... Uh, certainly wouldn't advocate for all of the all the video to be public, but how how do people get access to, say, a, a record of, an, of an, something that they were on site for or, or if they wanted to, to review? Yeah, so... Or say, I, video, you know, if I had an interaction with a police officer and wanted to see that video, what rights I would I have to that? So that would go to the FOIL presence, a record of the city, just as other records are. Certainly, it's going to be more intrusive video, particularly in people's homes or uh, schools, daycares, hospital settings like that. Um, so there will be a process for people to uh, request that video, just as they do request records for the city uh, in other ways. And I guess from your reviewing other police departments' um, policies, Foil, FOIL is a pretty um, surprisingly subjective uh, standard, despite it being in law. It seems like uh, it can take uh, extended time and or just get denied uh, for various causes. Um, is there anything beyond just saying it's part of the FOIL process that can be said about how the department would handle those FOIL requests uh, to make sure that when a civilian is interested in, in their own data, they have access to it. I think that might be best posed to the Corporation Council because FOIL is the law that we operate under. So I don't know that we can arbitrarily just decide to not follow that or to make it um, I don't know, more releasable or without going through the process. There still has to be a process, I think. No, I mean, I'm not arguing not to use FOIL. Certainly FOIL, I think, it is, is the framework we should work within. I just know that within that framework, uh, there's some leeway. Um, and so, I don't know if, if the Americans speak to that or, or if the policy speaks to it directly, um, but the importance of a body-worn camera program is both to protect uh, the force from uh, wrong allegations, uh, but also to uh, provide backup and, uh, and support to uh, citizen concerns and complaints. And when the data is entirely controlled by the force, uh, it makes it uh, there's a power imbalance there, and it's a difficult situation for uh, making sure that we have a strong uh, process so that everyone has access when when relevant. Yeah, if authorized and relevant, I, I would agree, but, but we have to look at that. Is the person authorized and is it relevant? So, yeah. Um, I think we can follow up on that conversation if, if you want. Okay. I even I. Great, thank you. We'll, we'll follow up. Cool. Are there any other questions for Chief Owens? If not, thank you, Chief, for attending the Public Safety Committee meeting. Um, and I'm sure all of us here, I'm not speaking for myself, um, appreci appreciate the update this evening. You're welcome. Thank you. Mayor Baden. Good evening, Mayor Madden. Good evening. Um, can you please give us an update on the governor's executive order of your working group? Sure, I'd like to actually give you a, uh, updates on a couple of things, if you don't mind, including that and, and the four, but other work that we've been doing. Um, I just want to uh, express my appreciation for the opportunity to, to speak to the council tonight on this and advise you on what we've been working on and, and what lies ahead with, uh, with respect to the police department. I also want to acknowledge that despite the enormity of the workload of the police department over the past six months, the department has carved out time to review policies and practices and make changes um, that are consistent with evolving standards and our shared um, value of increased uh, transparency. Um, let me go back to May 27th. That was two days after the killing of George Floyd and several days before the story and, and facts became widely known to the public. Um, Sergeant Keeler our, our, in our police department became um, aware of the incident. Uh, on the internet and he is the director of training for the department and he saw this uh, as an opportunity for education. So he prepared a memo uh, with a link to the video that was then available. 
and uh, reminding all of our officers um, of their obligation under our use of force policies uh, to avoid the use of chokeholds, um, to render aid to a suspect that's expressing difficulty in breathing, uh, and to place the subject in a safe position as soon as they are handcuffed and under control. So he reminded our, our department of their obligations um, that were quite at odds with what occurred in, in the George Floyd incident. Um, that marked the beginning of our review of our use of force policies. And shortly after the incident occurred, the eight can't wait principles of campaign zero became a topic of uh, popular conversation. And the essence of the campaign um, is eight procedural changes or eight procedural rules that campaign zero claims can uh, jointly decrease police violence by 72 percent. I never actually saw the data to back that up, but certainly some reductions seem plausible and the eight procedures were readily um, attainable. And those procedures included the first the ban of chokeholds or neck restraints, and although our policy did ban the use of holds or maneuvers that restricted a person's airflow, uh, it did not contain language affirmatively banning chokeholds. So our policy has been amended to reflect that. Second principle, it requires de-escalation. Our policy affirmatively speaks to the use of de-escalation techniques and our training um, protocols spend a lot of time on that with our officers. Um, third requirement was to require police officers to give a verbal warning when possible before shooting. That is and has been a requirement of our use of force. Um, the fourth was to require officers to exhaust all other reasonable means before shooting. And that too is consistent with our policy and training um, that speaks to the only using the level of force that is necessary to gain control of the suspect. And I just want to note with respect to this principle and the preceding one, which is to give warning, um, the use of deadly force is extremely limited under our use of force policies, as it should be. Uh, the fifth requirement was to require officers to intervene and stop excessive force used by other officers and re report such incidents immediately um, to the supervisor. That requirement has been in our policies for many years and is, is covered in our training protocols. The sixth was to ban shooting at moving vehicles unless necessary to protect the life of officers or civilians. That's contained in our policy. That's covered in our training as well. The second requires a use of force continuum. And although we don't use that particular language, our policy and our training require a continuous and constant adjustments to the use of force in any given situation. So as the situation warrants, force would be reduced where less force becomes necessary or increased incrementally as more force becomes necessary. And finally, the A principle requires officers to report each time they use force or threaten to use force against civilians. This is a long-standing requirement of ours. Uh, the report is a five-page document. Every use of force report is reviewed by the patrol sergeant uh, and again by the patrol captain. Um, as well as the use of force instructor. And the use of force instructor uses that data to uh, tailor training if he sees patterns evolving. So most of the policies in Eight Can't Wait have been in our general orders for a number of years. And these procedures, they're more than just prescriptions in a document. Our officers are trained extensively in these procedures. So should any of you wanna sit through a training session or participate in a use of force training, uh, we'd be glad to make that available to you. And in fact, I'd highly recommend it uh, to each and every one of you. Uh, in addition to the use of force general order, the department is reviewing and uh, revising the discipline general order. And the purpose is to ensure a higher degree of professionalism and accountability in the Inspectional Services Bureau, as, as the chief mentioned. Uh, we have a new uh, inspectional services captain um, who has taken the reins and um, is looking forward to making his mark in the department. And the, uh, the uh, goal also is to clearly um, define its role vis-a-vis -vis the newly constituted police objective review board, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Um, along those lines, I'd also like to point out that Detroit Police Department is accredited by the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services 
2020 marks a reaccreditation year. And so all of our general orders are being reviewed and if needed updated in anticipation of the reaccreditation. Um, I would like to point out that the, the department has been accredited for 20 years and that less than 50% of all police departments in the state have achieved that designation. So let me give you an update on the um, governor's executive order, the uh, New York State Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative. Uh, the collaborative is uh, deep into its planning phase. There are a number of key principles that are driving our process at this point. We don't want this to be a check the box exercise. We would like to get something meaningful and, and ideally something transformative out of this effort. So that I'm just saying we're not looking at this undertaking. Uh, just in an effort to satisfy a state requirement. Our desire is that the process is open and easy. We anticipate and will encourage broad participation from the community. Uh, this is a challenge under the best of circumstances uh, and it will be further complicated by COVID, but we're committed to doing everything we can to make that possible. Um, we are also driven by the, uh, the uh, understanding that there's broad appeal across all sectors. Uh, in the concept of reducing the footprint of policing. And accepting this as a goal will dictate who sits on the committee. So we're identifying partners who have experience, understanding and resources to see a path forward to accomplish that. That will be the steering committee and will need to be of a functional size. Uh, several, but not all of the perspective of, of members have already been solicited. There will be an opportunity for community input um, from those who are not sitting on the, on the steering committee. We are committed to that. The guidance that we had been waiting for from the state came out in uh, mid to late August, wasn't terribly useful. Um, so we are working with other sources for insight and ideas, including NICOM, New York Conference of Mayor, National League of Cities, the Justice Collaboratory, the African American Mayors Association, the National Criminal Justice Training Center, and the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. And I'm sure there will be others developed as we move forward. Uh, to promote trust, we are not attempting to do this internally. We're working with Khalil Jameson Consulting Group to help us design the process. Um, unfortunately, due to time constraints on their end, they're not gonna be able to manage the project itself. Um, but we are talking with other potential candidates to help me, excuse me, uh, perform the, the management process for us. Uh, time frame at this point is difficult to gauge. We're dependent on the calendars of a number of uh, busy people and entities, but it is getting our ongoing and immediate attention. Uh, there are a couple of additional training opportunities that have come up uh, that we're working on. The chief is working closely with CEO to bring back the EDPRT, Emotionally Distressed Persons Response Team training. This is a 40 hour training. Uh, we're scheduled to hold it in early December. It will be open to all law enforcement and first responders in Rensselaer County. A number of our officers had completed this course in the past, but we've been um, unable to hold it in the past three years. And there have been a number of new officers brought onto the force in the past three years. So this will be a good opportunity for them. We're also in conversations with Khalil Jameson Consulting Group. They've generously offered to work with our officers on a series of educational workshops entitled Enhancing, Poli Enhancing, the, Depol mm. Enhancing the Police Department to Meet the Needs and Wants of Today, Building Relationships. This is a series of training and education sessions that would be offered over a two year period. The goal is to equip our officers to maximize their effective uh, interactions with community members. And then finally, the chief has included in his 2021 budget funding to offer the Citizens Police Academy next year. This is something that has not been offered in several years and it can be an important tool in building trust in the community by way of educating the public to the duties, the challenges and the limitations of policing. Um, I'll go right into the Police Objective Review Board. I know this is a big salad here, and when we get to the end of it, you can ask uh, questions on any of them. Um, I've noted on in several occasions in the past um, that earlier iterations of the poor withered because of a lack of procedure and role clarity in our enabling legislation. 
and past board members have confirmed that view for me. Over, <clears throat> over the past several months, I've drafted a set of bylaws <clears throat> and operating procedures that uh, provide a great deal of operational clarity. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just losing my voice, it's not COVID. Uh, I've also met with Corporation Council uh, Assistant Chief Keen and the new captain in charge of uh, ISB, uh, Captain Kiley, <laughs> to clarify respective roles and to ensure for seamless communication between the board and the IAB. Training program has been developed and I've communicated with board members to <clears throat> hear their preferences regarding how the training should be delivered um, in one long setting, broken up into smaller meetings in person via Zoom. Um, we've got a lot of that worked out. So with that information, we're in a position to begin our training sessions. I'd love to get those started in the second half of October. Um, that will depend upon the uh, budget hearing schedule. It's gonna be a busy month. The board members are all accommodating and very eager to get started. So we're looking forward to, to working with them and our new IAB captain. So I think I've, I've covered the things you were looking for from me. If there are questions, I'm happy to address them. Okay. Council member Cummings. I wanted to follow up on a couple of the eight can't wait um, thing. The first uh, is sort of an overall question in terms of um, how they're uh, enforced and backed up. Um, you spoke about, for example, the requ uh, requirement for de-escalation. Um, our policy speaks affirmatively about that. Uh, to what degree is it required? What would be the process uh, to hear about a case uh, if, if de-escalation didn't happen, say, say some, some escalation happened? Um, what would be the internal process on that front? How do you how do you enforce yeah. that that policy, for example? Sure, an individual feels they've been aggrieved by um, a violation of that policy could certainly file a complaint, and then, then it would go to IAB for investigation. Um, another one of the principles is that uh, an officer uh, is duty bound uh, to report um, violations that he or she sees um, of another officer. So that would become an IAB case as well. Um, I think um, you know we're shooting for voluntary compliance. We're not shooting uh, for um, uh, punishment after the fact. We, we don't want these th things to happen. So we do spend a lot of time on techniques um, and we'd be happy to share those training protocols with you as well. Okay, and I guess in particular, as we, as we roll out the body cameras, uh, can you speak to the policy there uh, for uh, when those use of force uh, forms are filed, to what degree uh, will the lead up to that use of force uh, be reviewed uh, via body cam footage by the, uh, a, a senior member, of the, whether it's the IAB or, or another captain? You know the, how the policy is written on that? Uh, I'm uh, not sure I understood it. Could you yeah. clarify? So, so you were talking about the, we, we, we have the form that everyone fills out on uses of force. It seems like uh, as we get video evidence uh, increasingly could be helpful to at least do a spot check on those uses of force um, to have uh, captains reviewing for, for training purposes is probably more than disciplinary, but who knows. Um, the, the process that led up to a use of force um, on that video file uh, such that uh, if the trained de-escalation tactics weren't used, maybe some, some retraining would be needed there, for example. Um, is there uh, ability within our policy for uh, supervisors and, and captains to uh, review that body camera footage uh, on a, you know, whenever uh, a, a use of force uh, form has been filed uh, to make sure that the police was doing everything they could to de-escalate the situation rather than escalate it to that point. Yes, the policy and the setup will be uh, allow for the supervisors to review video. Um, and then as part of the review process, the use of force reporting review process, now that video will be a component of that review. So that is definitely included. There's also going to be other see... than use of force. Okay. Based on uh, it, I assume basically self 
reporting when there's a report based on but yeah i guess can you speak a little bit to that spot check process it will just be sort of generally someone will watch through a few hours of video every once in a while or um you guys are assigned members will review uh, they'll just take a sampling of their members and see if they handle a particular call how they handled it and again more for the training value uh, but right. potentially a disciplinary matter hopefully not okay okay um great that's helpful um and then can you speak a little bit more to how the enforcement of the uh requirement to intervene uh works i know that was uh, that's obviously uh key to the to the george floyd case uh that you spoke about uh you said we have that requirement in place and have for a while um what happens if you know i'm, I'm sure there are, are complicated uh social inter inter uh, relationships between a police officer so what's being done with sort of within the culture uh to encourage intervention and to um, incentivize it. Um, and then on the other side, uh, what can be done? Either is there a disciplinary process when someone fails to report that or to intervene, sorry. That's okay. I don't know if there's a, uh, a way to incentivize it other than the individual wanting to do the right thing. And we have that in place. I think our training supports that. I think our um, recruiting is part of the process. That's about culture. Yeah, and so, and so I think as a department, we've done very well in that regard. And one of the pieces of training that we do um, in terms of de-escalation, it, it's just to remember uh, to not take things personally. And so a lot of times that uh, is important. And so our members, I, I've seen in action not that they need to intercede in, in excessive force, but where uh, there might be a heated verbal exchange where one officer is just either uh, being, bearing the brunt of some insults, so another member will step in and again, to de-escalate and hopefully that resolve the problem. So uh, as an department, I, I think we're there. I think we have that ingrained in our members. Um, but then in cases where force is used, we'll, we'll review that and we'll see, was there an opportunity to de-escalate it? Um, I think we'll find most times that we're already doing this. I think the video will confirm that, but, but now we'll have that as an option to review. Great. And then uh, on those use of force reports, um, you said it's a, a three page report um okay. oh, five, five page report um can you speak a little bit into about i have a couple questions about what particularly is is on that report but then is there any aggregation of that data uh, or is it just uh kept on paper records uh, i understand now it's kept on paper records but we are trying to in, in, uh, implement a system so we can track that uh, we do hand counts of certain components of the report um, I think, I think we've given you copies of actual reports, uh, particular instance when you've shared some concerns and we can certainly share the blank um, copy with the entire council if anyone would like to see that. Yeah, I'd certainly like to see the use of force report. Um, one question in particular I had on it uh, was to what do, does it collect any anonymized uh, data about the demographic information for the person uh, against whom force was used? It does collect that information. It is still paper copies right now. So it's, it's printed out, it's filled out electronically, we print it out. So we have to tabulate that. Um, but going forward, we want to have that implemented so that we can keep up to date on the, the real time statistics on that versus trying to just manually go back in time and, and calculate all that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson McDermott. Council Member Zalewski. Uh, Chief, I, I had a question uh, just going back to the situation we had um, at the station where uh, you know one or a group of people were looking for a complaint form. And I think this had to do with Barker Park and you know the benches being removed and all of that that kind of escalated. Um, what was, I, I guess, what, what was the reason for not just giving these folks the complaint form? In other words, why are we making that difficult? Whereas if you go into Albany, you know, you go to Albany PD, you go to Schenectady PD, you say, I want us to file a complaint. You get the form, you file the complaint, and everything's fine. And by and I, I talked to some of our officers about this also, and they didn't really. They said, like, "No, we don't understand why the, the form is just not given out." So I just I wanted to go right to the top and ask, like, what is our policy on that form? And if it is something that's where we're not supposed to just give it out, uh, you know, just for any anyone coming in, then how can we change that to make it a little more 
available to people. Sure. I think we talked about that a little bit earlier, but uh, the process now stands. We wanted that direct uh, in-person contact, either with us as the police department or with the uh, city level corporation council. So we can evaluate, we can take that complaint in. Uh, a lot of times it can be resolved at that point if it's a misunderstanding or needs to be explained. In particular, answer you're talking about, uh, my understanding is the initial complaint was about something not related to the conduct of the police officer. So it wouldn't necessarily be a police complaint that we would uh, take in, but uh, if people have a complaint that should be directed elsewhere, then I don't know what the process looks like for other city departments. Um, but as it stands now, for the officers who said they didn't understand why, uh, they hopefully understand the process as it stands if they don't have a full understanding of why. That was just to make sure that we could evaluate the person making the complaint. And again, to have that conversation up front, maybe we can address it. Going forward, we are looking at a way to have an intake process that doesn't require a person to come in person to the station or to City Hall Corporation Council. Um, again, I want to make sure when we have that process in place that it, that initial intake does not constitute a complaint necessarily because the people who just artificially make these online anonymous complaints or even if they're not anonymous, it's going to drive up uh, potentially what the number of complaints look like for the department, which would not be accurate, would also not give us an opportunity to, to review or ask questions to follow up on what is the basis of this complaint. Um, so going forward, we are looking at ways to try to make that initial intake process easier. Okay, I, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, I don't, and again, none of us were there. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what the exchanges were, but I, just a part of me feels that that situation escalated. And I think it could have been handled, you know, we could have de-escalated it, you know, e even if the form wasn't the right form or what, you know, even if it was not necessarily a police issue, you know, doing something to, you know, let, let these folks know that we're there, like, well, listen, we, we, we want to accept your complaint, but it's not a police issue. Uh, you know, we come on in, we're going to call up city hall. We'll help you get in touch with the people that you need to talk to, or just, just something more than just, you know, I think what happened there is we created an us versus them situation. And then from there, it just, it got worse. Um, and I just, again, to me, it's, it's a piece of paper that you fill out. I know there's more, but I, I understand you have to take an officer off duty, or, you know, you're basically taking a resource and allocating them to the filing of the report. I, I understand, you know, what happens there. But I just feel like we want to make it as easy as possible for citizens uh, to be able to, uh, you know, interact with the police in this manner. Um, and anything I can do to support that, uh, you know, I'm happy to help out. Sure. Yeah, we appreciate that. So that wasn't the first time that uh, the individual involved in that complaint came in. It was fully explained, is my understanding, to them as well uh, regarding their complaint or whether it was, should be directed to the police department. Uh, we also have an obligation to uh, uh, remain open in the lobby so that we can uh, deal with other people who are involved. So I don't want to get too far into that uh, situation, that incident, because it uh, actually could be uh, litigation. Um, can we handle things differently at other times? Sure, that can be said about anything. Um, if, if making the intake or that initial complaint form available resolves that, I think that'll be helpful. I don't know that that was necessarily the only issue at the time. That, that happened, but uh, I do appreciate what you're saying, and we are we are trying to find a way to make that happen. Thank you, Chief. I, I understand that you know any situation is not always as simple as what might be portrayed. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I get that there's there's a lot going on in any of these situations. So I, I'm just I'm just looking to, of course, just find a way to mitigate you know tension between the police and the community. And we want we want people to understand that the police are here to uh, to serve and to protect us. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly we're just going to try to create conflicts and confrontations. So we're aware of that. And we do try to de-escalate and, and uh, we'll make the process easier for that initial complaint. And, and uh, hopefully we can bring that to you soon to say what that looks like. That's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. Chair. Council President. Yep. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chief. Um, I think, obviously, that it's truly important for obvious, not just us, but the public to hear what 
is happening in terms of training, policies, de-escalation, excessive force. Um, I think it'd be helpful um, if we could get a copy of the, um, I'm, I'm not sure if they're uh, police policies, executive orders, but you kind of um, drove down an eight point plan, I believe, Mayor. Maybe if you could provide us with that, I, I think it'd be helpful, but um, you know, in terms of what Council Member Zalewski said and, and the Chief, um, I, you know, I, I wasn't there that day either. And, you know, there, there always uh, is more to the story, which I'm sure will come out. But there's also, um, listen, we're human and we can always do better. And that's why the PORB is super important and it's overhauled, which is great. And I'm wondering, Mayor, do you have a date uh, for maybe when their first meeting will take place? As I said earlier, we, we are trying to find a date in October. It's a, it's a packed month, as you well know. Um, and it's going to, I've got eight other people there, plus, um, let's see, I have three other members who are not voting members. So I have 11 people whose schedules I have to coordinate uh, in the month of October. So I would love to do it um, in the month of October. I'd love to do it shortly after the budget goes out, maybe later next week. Um, but it is going to be challenging, so I don't want to um, overpromise here. I get it. And do you see uh, the poor but also working obviously hand in hand with, I mean, we have so many task force now. You have the poor uh, super important group and, you know, they are, certainly probably going to intertwine with the governor's executive order task force and then soon we'll be hearing uh, an update on the council reimagine um obviously some people might be on vote on a couple of these um saying all of that uh I, I, it's definitely going to be a challenge but do you see the poor bed lease intertwining with the governor's executive task force I do. I reserved a seat on the steering committee for the chair of the four board. Very good. Okay. Uh, two more quick things. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yes. Um, we talk about the community, the partnership, obviously, with uh, the police force. And I thought um, a great initiative was announced. I believe it was 2016 or 2017, Mayor, uh, the Safe Cam where folks um, from the community are registering their private security cameras. Um, I, I'm not sure if that is um, still being pushed aggressively, but maybe we could um, kind of rejuvenate that program and get people more involved and have that partnership, um, you know, because obviously that started out kind of a big hit and maybe it's laxed a little, but maybe we could rejuvenate that effort. Um, I'm not sure what you think, Chief. Do we have much? We, we've never really had too much involvement with that. We had some people um, provide their information. It's, it's helpful to a degree to have that uh, registry, just to have a point of contact. But in most cases where there's a, uh, a crime or something serious we need to investigate, we're gonna go in Canvas area anyway to look for cameras that are gonna be in the area. Um, but yeah, I think it's still on the city website. Um, we could we could push, we could push it again. It again yeah. You know, it's in the past three years, a lot more people have gotten cameras. The ring doorbell and others of of uh, that ilk um, have become very popular. Um, so we might have a whole new crew of people who might be interested now who just didn't even read it in the past because they didn't have cameras. So we can push it again. Awesome, and you know, Mayor, honestly, that that was something. Uh, that you announced, I was very supportive, and I do agree. I mean, believe me, campaigning four years ago or three years ago compared to last year, it was unbelievable, all the people with the ring and uh, the different uh, private cameras out, out front. So you had to be really careful um, what you were saying. No, I'm kidding, which is a little like this. Um, but Council Member McPherson would always remind me. No, I'm kidding. But saying that, um, I think I think it's a really worthwhile program and anything we can do to help you on that. And, you know, Chief, I just want to say, um, 
I, I did drive along and I know another uh, a number of other council members have done drive alongs and uh, saying that to see firsthand the calls, I was on a warrant call, um, I was on a mental health call, um, to see these calls and to go from one spectrum to the other really certainly um, enlightened me. Um, I grew up with a day as a cop, so I did see it kind of firsthand, but when you're in that car, um, one of the things I did see, I saw uh, the community, and I know you're working so hard to get our officers to stop, walk, and talk. Somehow, we gotta be able to free up our officers. And I know you're so passionate about this. I know you are. I've seen them stop at Little League games over in Central Little League, Berg, so whatever, you know, you can do to keep that moving forward, it's so critical in our neighborhoods. And we have so many new men and women on the force. Um, you know, I know they're a little apprehensive. Um, I get it. It's not like the days of my dad on the beat. Um, so I know a lot of training and a lot of efforts going into that. And I didn't know if you wanted to touch on that. You're absolutely right. Any positive contact we can have with members of the community, it's great, and we do certainly encourage that. But as you just mentioned, the pace of the uh, each shift, it's just it's it's not what it used to be. So it doesn't allow for that free time, if you will, to just stop and talk to people. Um, but it is. It's it's encouraged, and we try to do more of it. If we have overtime details and they're not directly responding to calls or they're not handling a particular scene, that's one of the things they're doing. They're they're on a walking post and they're in a neighborhood and they're doing that. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's a challenge. It's just, uh, again, there's just not enough people, not enough time to do all the things we want to do, uh, but we're trying. So the call volume is um, increases each year. We're answering over 50,000 calls a year right now. Um, so that's close to, what, 140 a day. Um, and each one of those, or probably 90% of them, have paperwork um, on the back end of them. And uh, as we all know, paperwork requirements um, don't lessen as time goes on, they increase. So um, not only are they making the calls, more calls, but they're having to deal with more paperwork on, a, on an annual basis. It's really tough. Everybody shares the value of getting out, talking, uh, and meeting the community. It's just, it's so hard to do. Totally agree. Thank you. Chair. Council member Ash McPherson. I just want to, you know, dovetail on that mayor and what you just said. There was also a lot of times that people would say that the officers are sitting in their car and they're busy on their computers or they're not paying attention what's going on. They're actually taking that few minutes downtime to try to do their paperwork in a, a parking spot in the area. And they're actually parking on a street in an area being seen, they're not hiding but they're actually trying to do their paperwork as well. So, I mean, there's a lot that they're doing um, while they're working to try and, and get that paperwork done. So that I just want to dovetail on that with you. Good point. Are there any other questions? A couple quick follow-ups. Council member Cummings. Um, one, uh, I was wondering if you could give a rough estimate as to what total, what percentage of total time is spent on paperwork, um, and if there are any, um, sort of best practices or, or opportunities for whether it's digitization or better systems that might, uh, help, uh, autofill certain things based out of the in one center, or, uh, if it really is just, it is what it is and it, and it, and it takes the time it takes. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to give you a number on the percentage of time. It's significant for sure. We do have MDTs, mobile data terminals in the car, they're tablet computers. Um, the county, uh, as part of a, a tri county or regional initiative, they're changing their CAD, so the computer aid dispatch, along with that, is our records management system. The two are not tied together yet, so we can't, like, autofill, as you mentioned, or import some of the call data into the report form. Um, it's also not always practical to take the tablet out of the car to handle a report. Um, 
car accidents, vehicle crashes are a good example. Usually the officers are in the car, they can complete that report electronically, submit it without having to return to the station for the most part. Uh, so that does keep us in the zone longer. Um, I don't know that we'll ever get to a fully paperless or a fully, um, you know, just electronic reporting that prevents paperwork. It's always going to be a requirement. I, I don't, we can try to reduce it to some degree when we get this new CAD and RMS, RMS system in place. It'll, it'll help us fill in some of that data, pre-populate it, but uh, it's still going to be a requirement that somebody's inputting it, whether they're handwriting it or it's being typed in. It's still going to be time consuming to a degree. Uh, but again, to that point, our officers are trying to do that on the road to stay in service, to stay available in uh, real time. Um, require them to come back to the station. Um, certainly, whether there's evidence or property collected, that's got to be turned in physically. Um, if there's a camera, there's a desk camera that can be used for certain crimes. It doesn't involve an evidence technician. That's one way we've tried to free up uh, the full evidence technician packet. Um, so there are ways that technology can be useful to free up some of that time, but it's, it's always going to be a component where somebody's got to do the report, whatever that is, written or electronic. Um, well, that sounds good. Certainly, what is the timeline on the on the new system? <laughs> County thing. So we'll see. It's going back and forth a number of times. Um, I'm, I'm talking over the course of years now. Um, okay. I really can't estimate when when that's going to be in place. Um, Certainly, obviously, the more the more time we can, the, the more we can optimize the paperwork, the more folks can be out on the street. So. Uh, anything we can do to support uh, the resources needed to do that, uh, that seems helpful. Um, and then the other follow-up I had was about the policies. Um, I, has there been discussion? Is there possibility of making those generally uh, available on the city website? What would it take to to sort of sort through and publish all of the police policies? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, our use of force general order is online already. It's on the city website. Has that one been updated or is that the old one? This, the old one have to memo that supersedes it. But um, we can put something on there. Most most of the general orders, um, the practices are not uncommon or, or um, sensitive in nature or confidential. So I think for the most part, many of them can be posted online. Whether there's particular tactics or things like that, we'd have to look at those individually and uh, decide if we want to, you know, Put out publicly how we handle certain types of calls, like a, a response to a bank sure. robbery, something like that. Sure. Um, but yeah, use of force, or um, as we complete the revised discipline policy, things like that. Some of those more uh, hot topic issues we can certainly put online for people to to see. Great, that would be helpful. Uh, and then I, I agree with Council President Mantello about uh, the need to maybe, in addition to publishing them in their whole, um, sort through and and. For example, take the eight count weight uh, sections and and point to those in a more uh, user friendly format. I assume uh, getting through uh, the general orders to to verify the eight can't wait uh, ideals uh, would be a lot more reading than uh, than just a website that would show. Uh, each of those snippets. So certainly I would encourage uh, anything we can do to, to publicly communicate uh, the work that y'all are doing, um, both uh, in terms of showing the work, showing the data uh, and the overall policies, as well as uh, showing the particular uh, parts that are uh, relevant to that discussion. Um, yeah, so thank you. Welcome. Mayor, I have one question. Can you elaborate a little bit on your Citizens Police Academy? Well, um, it hasn't run since I've been here, but I've heard good things about it. So I'm going to turn that over to the chief. Yeah, it hasn't run in a number of years. It's probably several mayors before you, but it's it's an opportunity for us to bring in members of the public and go through uh, a series of subjects of what the police deal with. So they'll see up front a lot of things that we encounter on a daily basis. It's just a great I think it'll be a great opportunity for people to see what goes on and to have that connection with the community. Um, it's gonna be very labor intensive because we have to have instructors and presenters to do each of the topics. And it's probably gonna be somewhat limited if we roll it out this uh, into 2021 to the number of people that can participate just because of the time requirements. Uh, so generally our plan would be to do it on certain weeknights 
if that works best for the group. Um, and a couple hours at a time over the course of many weeks. And just to try to expose people to what are some of the common things uh, required of police officers today. Um, I don't think movies and TV shows and uh, even if people read books about the topic, I don't think that fully uh, paints the entire picture. So this is something we've been trying to do for a number of years. It's uh, not an easy undertaking, but I think it would be worthwhile if we can uh, fully support that. Again, we have the vacancies I mentioned, people in training, people out for other things. It just cuts into our available pool. So to take people out to do this is going to take them away from other tasks, whether they're in the detective bureau, patrol bureau, community services. Um, but it's something we really want to try to get off the ground in the next year. Um, so as we develop more, we'll, we'll put it out to the council. So hopefully you can push it out to your constituents and we can get the public involved. Again, I think it's going to be fairly limited at first, size-wise, but uh, I think it'll be a good thing. I think we both agree that it's a way to create more transparency into the department's operations. And that's something that's needed right now. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, but I just called the uh, Troy PD non-emergency line on uh, Councilman Gully. I'm just kidding. He's voting. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask Council Member Sue Steele um, to give an update on the Reimagine Working Group. Thank you, Chair. Um, as we recall, we passed on a bipartisan basis, Resolution 71, uh, and that was forming a Reimagine Troy Community Justice Services Workgroup. Um, and I believe everyone has had an opportunity to look through the messages and resumes that we received in response to that. I wanna thank um, all the members of the community who did um, step up and uh, express an interest in this effort. Um, we could not take everyone involved, but I think we have a good cross section. Um, this group will be a real working group. And so I had the opportunity today uh, to speak with most of these folks and explain to them that um, this, is, this is a real commitment of time uh, that we are going to be uh, researching other communities, the work that's being done in other um, states as well, um, and um, develop uh, some thoughts, recommendations uh, regarding possible uh, policy changes or uh, going forward um, in our community. Um, it, I think it's going to be a great opportunity to bring folks of differing viewpoints together. And um, I'm looking forward to some challenging conversations, but productive ones. And again, to all that I spoke, all of the folks I spoke with today um, shared, shared that um, as well. So I think that's a positive um, viewpoint um, that, that this is not going to be um, a negative or a um, divisive group. Um, that's certainly my goal. And um, Chair McDermott has asked me to sort of act as convener. She's gonna be serving on the mayor's uh, reimagine or revision group. And so I'm gonna get this group up and running and, and help coordinate and we'll be collaborating. Both groups will be in constant communication. Um, I hope we can be a resource uh, to the mayor's uh, folks and we'll be in in, in conversation. And we certainly aren't going to um, uh, in any way uh, duplicate efforts because I think that's a waste of everyone's time, uh, especially when our community has uh, so many folks who wanna be heard and, and, uh, and have information to share. So um, if, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Otherwise I'd like to uh, offer the names of those I've shared with you all uh, to serve on the work group. 
Um, Chair. Council member Ash McPherson. Um, Councilwoman Steele, I just have a couple questions. Yes. I saw the list of the names on the, um, my email just went down, so I apologize. Is according to the resolution 71, it says in here that there was going to be, um, you want to assemble the public safety committee to be comprom uh, comprised of community leaders, clergy, police, and public safety professionals. Um, do we have any clergy on this? I didn't see it. Well, um, I know we all bear the responsibility. Uh, I certainly reached out to a number of clergy uh, in the community. Um, I No, we do not have anyone, uh, but I think it's perfectly legitimate for this group to um, identify clergy as stakeholders in the community and have conversations with them. Um, as there are far, still, I apologize, sorry, go ahead. Um, you know, we don't have a full complement of nine at this point in time, so there is uh, space. And certainly if you have someone uh, to recommend who's willing to serve, um, we'd welcome that uh, opportunity. This has been in the works for uh, several months now um, so I'm, I'm glad that to see the interest um, to de tonight. Has there, uh, are you looking for any police or any public safety, fire department or anybody else on this? Is well, uh, I've already, uh, the, the chief weighed in on Jerry Matthews and gave him a glowing uh, recommendation. I think you probably saw that by email. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, Jerry brings, brings uh, that perspective to the group. Um, we did reach out, did not receive um, a, a fire representative at this point, but again, there is a vacancy. Um, you know, I, the message I got was, as I think we've heard again tonight, um, our forces are, are maxed out and we don't want to take them from the important work that they're doing. Um, but again, if you have someone from the fire community that you would like to recommend, uh, please feel free to share and the next thing is you're saying that you want to put these, this, we're not doing a vote on this, correct? We can't do a vote on this tonight. No, we've already, we already adopted the resolution and per that resolution tonight, we are naming the, the uh, work group. And so oh. if you, if there are no other questions, I would like to put in, mo make a motion uh, to name the group. Um, and I have the, the names, but if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, hearing none, then Chair, I would like to move the following members to serve as the Council's Reimagine Troy Community Justice Services Work Group, uh, Akiva Bembo, Jamie Krause, Rhea Drysdale, Jerry Matthews, Linda O'Malley, Amani Olubala, Jack Raquel Velho. Chair, I will second that. All in favor? We, we need a second. Oh. I think Ken seconded it. I just seconded. You, you, you got a second by Council Member Zalewski. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And Jim, were you and I? And Council Member McPherson? Um, I didn't realize we were taking a vote on this. I thought in order to take a vote, we had to have an open forum. Is, is this legislation that you're passing or? No legislation. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to, I said no in the beginning because it's a <coughs> meetings on top of the meetings. And is this, I, I'm not sure how this is going to mesh with the, the mayor's plan for his, but um, I'm just gonna stay with my original and say no. I'm sure you're gonna have a great team, but I'm just gonna say no. Sorry, it carries with a 4-1 vote. Chair. Chair. Council member Mantello. 
Council President. Oh, excuse um, me. No problem. Hey, uh, I, I just want to, um, once again, I voted in favor uh, on the floor at the regular meeting for the reimagined uh, task force. Um, I expressed my concerns at that time um, because between the PORB, uh, the Police uh, Objective Review Board, uh, the mayors at that time pending uh, task force under the governor's executive order um, and um, the policy obviously being worked on with body cams, the policies uh, in terms of uh, our de-escalation and training, et cetera. Um, I, my concern is how are all these going to mesh together? However, um, I'm always open to more public input. So I vote in favor of this, but I do just want to express uh, my concerns with the amount of task forces. And, you know, I did see uh, not a lot of folks really stepped up to the plate for the council's reimagined task force. And it, this is in no slight to what everyone's trying to do. I, I really want to make that point. But um, it's hard for people to volunteer on a weekly basis. I believe that that's the mission of the task force to meet weekly. And uh, I know the mayor obviously is you know, having a tough time trying to get some folks on the task force of the governor's executive order. So I, I just want to caution, um, I wanna make sure that we're just not meeting to meet. Uh, we also have a North Central group um, where by district two, I should say, where myself and council member McDermott and council member Ash McPherson with the mayor, the chief, the fire, uh, clergy, uh, community, so many folks involved in that effort, NAACP. So there's a lot of groups, a lot of task forces, and I, I just want us to caution that there aren't so many meetings that we're losing sight of the bigger picture, that we're losing sight, that we have a real opportunity over these next five, six months to really you know, work with the police, work with the community, work as one tray um, to have an impact to try over long-term, short-term, low-hanging fruit to change um, some of the things happening in our city. So I just don't want to turn off people. That's that's just my, my fear with all the task forces and all the meetings and all the paperwork and you know, we, we have a budget, we're going to have 25 meetings in the month of October and early November. So we just need to be cautious as we move forward. And um, I'm not sliding the task force or anything, and I'll do everything humanly possible um, to try to help. Okay. Just had to get that out. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Here. Sure. Council Member Steele. Um, thank you, Council President. Um, I just wanna reassure you, uh, again, I spoke with these people individually. Uh, none of them uh, duplicate any of the other groups that you have um, talked about. They felt very capable of, the, of volunteering their time. I think we have a great group. And I think what we need to do is encourage our volunteers, our citizens, and encourage the kind of conversations that we need uh, to move forward on a positive level. Thank you. Sure. Council Member Cummings. Um, I just wanna uh, publicly thank this group of folks for stepping up on this. Um, I don't have a vote on the committee, so I couldn't vote in their favor, but I certainly appreciate their willingness to uh, collaborate with us on exploring the future of how uh, we deliver these important services. Uh, I heard a couple notes today uh, from uh, Council Member McPherson as well as uh, Council Member McDermott uh, underlining uh, the community uh, desire uh, for some policing in that neighborhood uh, and particularly in response to the violent crime that's happening. Uh, and I certainly hear that too. Uh, I wanted to also underline though, uh, we hear similar calls uh, from that community for uh, enhanced lighting, enhanced recreation, uh, enhanced access to jobs, 
uh, enhanced vacant property abatement. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work uh, that needs to be done to uh, to build uh, on our work in these communities uh, and to uh, enhance the public safety of everyone uh, from all angles. And so certainly uh, I wanna express the support of this uh, council and of this group uh, to work in a holistic way uh, to uh, support these communities in, in building into ever safer and ever ever more secure communities and vibrant. Mm -hmm. Chairperson McDermott. Council member Zalewski. Yeah, and I just wanted to address uh, Council President Mantello's concern about uh, you know, too many groups, too many task forces, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, do we really know what we're doing? I think the answer to some, to, to, in some respects here is we don't exactly know what we're doing because we are in an uncharted territory here. Um, you know, there's never been a time that I'm aware of in history that, uh, you know, that we've had uh, social upheaval of this magnitude. Well, I, we have had <laughs> social upheaval in history, but uh, in terms of modern history and in having a governor tell all municipalities around, uh, his state uh, that, you know, I, we need each one of you to come up with a plan to reimagine uh, community justice services and, uh, and policing. Uh, that, as far as I know, that hasn't uh, been requested of municipalities before. So, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can for sure. Um, and I, I feel like the plan that we've put forward where the mayor, you know, the executive branch is going to be working on this uh, from their perspective and the legislative branch has, has formed a, a work group and, and we're gonna be working on that from our perspective. And then I, I think council president, you, you asked like, how are, are we gonna be able to mesh? I feel like we will. I feel like everyone will come together at the end of this process. It's gonna be a months, you know, multiple months long process. Uh, we'll come together and you know, our work group will have uh, the results of their analysis and their conversations and the mayor's group will have the results of um, you know, their conversations and the poor will have their input and it, it, it will I, I think it will come together because we you know we have to make it happen we, we have to make it happen um, but yeah it's uh, it's we're in uncharted territory so it's it's hard to say exactly how this is going to happen because it's we've never done this before thank you chair council president mantello um, council member Cummings uh, mentioned something and I want to hit on it. Unfortunately, the majority uh, decided not to put this on this evening's agenda. But when we're talking about quality of life, I had asked uh, to talk about what I feel is super important and what I talked to the chief about, and that is kind of lower level, blighted buildings, things to that nature, kind of rising and pride in our neighborhoods what that impact has on our uh, crime and violence and just a neighborhood quality of life feeling. So what I'd like to throw out there is um, something that council member Ash McPherson, council member Gully, uh, targeted effort to hit quality of life in all four zones, which actually would be comprised of a community police officer, a code enforcement officer, a DPW, a DPU, representative, a litter patrol officer, and a neighborhood representative from that particular zone in the council member who represents that district to hit the blighted buildings, hit code enforcement, you know, raise that pride in that neighborhood. If you walk through our neighborhoods, something very simple, the night uh, council member Cummings and all of us, many of us were there and a group actually cleaned up the park at the end of Old Six while a vigil was happening for Ishan. So those things need to happen, but if we can use our forces to uh, target block by block of quality of life improvements, we will see a turnaround and just a morale factor and a pride factor in our neighborhoods, which will then have an impact on uh, violence in just neighborhood uh, activity in terms of crimes. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, I will take any and all input. Um, I hope I came across in terms of, we want all volunteers, but guess what? We also want action. And what I'm hearing from a lot of folks in the neighborhood, yes, we'll meet, we'll meet every other week. We've been meeting since August, but guess what? 
we also want action. So simultaneously, we have to start hitting some of these quality of life issues in our neighborhood and meet. I have no problem meeting, but the action has to happen. Thanks. Do, do we have any other questions, concerns for the chief and the mayor? Uh, Chair. Councilmember Ash McPherson. I would just like to say thank you to Councilwoman Sue Steele. She worked very hard on this reimagine and I, I'm very happy. I just, it's, it's gonna be a great group, I know it is. I'm just not there with her, as I said before, but I do commend her for working very hard on that. So thank you, Sue, or Councilwoman Steele. The work is just beginning. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I'd like to thank the chief and the mayor for attending this meeting. I'd also like to thank our city council members and our city clerk, Kamara, and also the public. Um, with that, I would like a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Well, uh, we have a vote to motion to adjourn our meeting. Made and seconded, all in favor? All in favor, sorry. <laughs> Aye. And now you put your mask. masks on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, everyone. All right, folks. We'll see you Thank back you on Thursday night, 6 p.m. Yep. Can't wait. Six. Bye. Stay safe. Oh, okay. Great.